Appellate judges do not like to disturb the findings of a trial judge. The trial judge would have spent the best part of six months or a year observing witnesses. He'd have thought about orders he should make against your client. Appeal judges like to maintain status quo. If you wish to change the Court of Appeal's mind, you need something special. If you are at the first level of appeal, you'd have to sprint up a 45 degree incline in 5% of the time you'd have spent arguing at the trial court. If you're at the second and final tier of appeal, confronted by three to five judges, the incline is 85 degrees. The time is cut in half. Nothing save a serious issue of law will help. Yet, that is but one point. There are 30 more to appellate success. Some are my own. The others are the thoughts of brilliant minds gathered together by the famous lawyer, Bryant Garner, and his runaway success the winning brief, buy it and read every line. I've quoted him as much as I can. These are not the only rules, nor need they be read in any order. Take your pick. If you are the appellant, although the following are suggestions aimed at appellant's counsel, they are equally helpful to any respondent's counsel as well. Tip number one, master the three tells. They are, tell the judges what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you've just told them. It's a roadmap. It enhances a court's understanding. Try it. Tip number two, create the scene and pop the question. Tell the Court of Appeal story in 50 to 75 words. No more. Then pop the question. Look at this bold question. Whether a surgeon is liable for negligence if he does not advise a patient of a non-essential element of surgery. 21 words, blah, 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 boring. Contrast that with this scenario plus question. Example two, we act for the surgeon. The trial judge's foundational logic rested on the assumption that every surgeon was required to advise a patient undergoing a gallbladder surgery. Every conceivable risk, even non-essential one. If a matter is not central to the surgery, and no advice is given on it, and the unforeseen injury is sustained, is the surgeon negligent? That's the question. 64 words. Which example is lucid? The first is simple, but it's oversimplified. The second is the whole appeal. Everything relevant is there. Not one more word is necessary. That's what an appeal on a question of law looks like. Go straight to the point but back it up with facts. Let me take you to tip number three. Only appeals premised on questions of law succeed. Those based on facts or evidence will fail. So keep your appeal limited to questions of law. Unless they are gargantuan errors, don't go anywhere near facts or evidence. Tip four, strike for the jugular and let everything else go. Multiple issues, only betray a lack of confidence. Use one point, never go beyond three. The mind of an appellate judge is habitually receptive to the suggestion that a lower court committed an error, but the receptiveness declines as the number of complaints increase. So multiplicity hints at a lack of confidence. Present no more than one, if not no more than three points of the strongest claims that the trial court heard. Take them in order of importance. As a lawyer, you must make difficult choices. You must make calculated judgments in abandoning some points for appeal. When an appellant's brief contains more than five points, said a judge, there is a presumption that there is no merit in any one of them. The US judge Leonard Hand once extolled the fine examples of Mr. Charles Neve, the great patent lawyer, for his confidence in choosing arguments. With the courage which only comes of justified self-confidence, he dared to rest his case upon its strongest point and so avoided that appearance of weakness and uncertainty which comes of a clutter of arguments. Few lawyers are willing to do this. It is the mark of the most distinguished talent. Ramani would take one point and go all the way up to the highest court. He was known as a legal lion. Now, tip number five. Locate the pivotal passages in the judgment appealed against. 
Look at the grounds of judgment. It will have one or two pivotal passages. They are pivotal because the entire fulcrum of the case turns on them. Locate them. Demonstrate how a legal error has occurred in those passages. Point it out to the Court of Appeal. Even omissions can result in an error of law, especially if the omitted point was one which should have never been left behind by the trial judge. Now you have to show to the Court of Appeal why it was fatal to the trial judge's reasoning. Tip number six, tell them what your complaints are. These are the deep issues. The moment you rise on your feet, the judges will ask you, what are your complaints? Tell them. Stop messing around with facts. The judges want to know what your complaints are. Don't keep them waiting, wait in. Identify how many complaints you have. Don't cross three or you'll be asking for trouble. Show immediately what these three are. Say, my lords, my ladies, I have three complaints. They are as follows. Could I please summarize them? Then summarize them. Then show the court which pivotal passage contain errors of law. If the trial judge makes an omission, point out the omission as an error of law. Tip number seven, sound reasonable, make sense. One judge said your whole case on law and facts must make sense, must appear as being obvious, inescapable. It must make sense in the simple terms of life and justice. The goal of a judge is not to reach a decision supported by the rule of law, but to dispense justice to the parties. Therefore, he will be quite uncomfortable with any argument based on precedence alone, unless it's clear to him where the equities lie. Tip number eight, replace humdrum phrases with snappy ones, spark interest. Think of how many dreary briefs the judges are forced to read in a judicial lifetime reams and reams of them. Oh my God, the judges are dying by the time they are finished with your brief. Snappy. What can you do to make your work sparkle so that the judges actually looks forward to reading what you have to say? For example, take this phrase. The plaintiff merely takes two paragraphs out of context from publication 2348, which is a manual dealing with career opportunities. Contrast that with example number four. John merely plucks two isolated paragraphs from the manual. Look at example five. The trial court made a finding of fact that the abrupt manner in which John made his departure from the firm and its subsequent solicitation of the firm's employees interfered with the firm's existing contracts with clients in the firm's prospective business. Look at another example. The trial court found that the way Jones bolted from the firm and then raided its employees interfered with the firm's existing contracts and its prospective business. So you must write your brief not only to be understood, but if possible to be relished. You need to interest the judges. You got to make them feel when they come to the brief, oh baby, this is going to be hot. And they've got to approach the brief with that favorable atmosphere. Imagine if the judge is going to think, oh my God, I'm going to listen to two hours of dribble. They'll put on strong face on, they'll grind their teeth, they'll sit back and you're dead. Tip number nine, make the court unhappy with status quo. The appellant's counsel aims to make the judges feel dissatisfied so that they will change the status quo. The respondent wants the judges to feel satisfied, to preserve the status quo. That's the secret. Tip number 10, in your own written submissions, make your point in 90 seconds. On the first page, the judge must get your stand on the basic question, the answer to that question, why, the reasons for the answer. What does a persuasive issue look like? See example four. Under federal law, US companies cannot provide payment goods or services for travel to or from Cuba. Libra Air is a Canadian airline. It has a reciprocal air mileage program with Eastern Airways. Through it, travelers could redeem points interchangeably between the airlines. Several Canadian citizens flew from Toronto to Havana on Libra Air. 
They now hope to redeem those miles with Eastern Airlines. Pop the question, is it legal for Eastern Airlines to provide the Canadian citizens with mileage credit for travel? Total 80 words. Some lawyers would take at least 10 pages, said one judge, to deliver that information. And you wouldn't even find that concise statement at page 10. Instead, you would find the tidbits within it strewn amid other facts throughout the first time to glean the issue the judges would have to read slowly and with intense concentration. It would drain them. It's quite a demand to make on busy judges, said another judge. Tip number 11. Make your citations few and unobtrusive. They shouldn't block the judges from reading. Every time a judge reads a sentence, he trips over the citations. So one judge said, avoid a paroxysm of citations. Use authority sparingly and only to the extent necessary to support a well thought out theory. So place the citations and have them available as roadmaps, not as obstacles. Always subordinate the citations to the statements they support. Any interruption to the flow of language is a source of difficulty and irritation to the judge. See, for example, this statement in Fitzpatrick versus Illinois Human Rights Commission 267, Roman 3, Appeals.3D, 386, 642, Note number 8 to 486, open bracket, the district 1944, close bracket, the plaintiff alleged that the employer discriminated on the basis of physical handicap, the plaintiff had been diagnosed with a sleeping disorder by simply transferring her from the day shift to the night shift. ID at page 7, 6422D at 4, 8, and boring, boring, boring. Contrasted with example 9, in Fitzpatrick, the plaintiff alleged that the employer discriminated on the basis of physical handicap. This is because the plaintiff had been diagnosed with a sleeping disorder. The employer simply transferred her from the day shift to the night shift. And then citation, Fitzpatrick versus Illinois Human Rights Commission, all the numbers, close bracket. Which reads better? Which one would you want to read? Tip number 12. If you want to cite a case, explain what it stands for. The purpose of a citation should be explained. The judge shouldn't guess it. The case may be important on its facts, on its holdings, its reasoning, its approval of other authority, of, of an observation that is a dictum. So, for what purpose are you citing? So, it's essential to tell the judges, why are you citing that case? Number 13, ask for criticism. You know, most of the cases are decided on written arguments. Long before the judge comes up, either he would have read it or his assistant would have read it. So, why not focus your energies on testing your own written arguments Instead of your oral arguments, go to your friends, ask them for assessment or criticism. You know, it's not an admission of weakness to ask the help of third parties to assess the difficulties of the case. Ask them to criticize your presentation, your arrangement, your argument. Then they'll point out this one doesn't make sense. That's a bit too iffy. This is true drudgy. Can you slow down? That's too much. Then think about that. Get a third party eye to look at it. Tip number 14. Read your submissions repeatedly, revise, prove carefully, give it to others to prove it. Some lawyers use bold fonts for parts of a passage, others underline, some italicize. Some mad people capitalize whole sentences. There are fellows who are psychos who do all of it. That's bad writing. Open a law book. Look at how arguments are developed. See how they physically appear. Are they bolded? Italicized? or underlined portions. So please use standard editing marks. There is a standard called the OSCOLA, Oxford University Standard for the Citation of Legal Authorities. That is the standard we should all aspire towards. Tip number 15, make your deep issues as concrete as you can within 75 words. An abstract style is always bad. The sentences should be full of stones, metals, chairs, tables, animals, men and women, says one judge. Professor Garner calls it populating the narratives. 
So, Ahmad is preferable to the plaintiff. Lee is better than the fourth respondent. Then again, the statement should show that the precise point of substantive law and its applicability to the facts at hand. Thus, was the plaintiff guilty of contributory negligence vaguely indicates a general issue. Would it not be more helpful to concentrate the court's understanding if you state the issue as follows? The plaintiff's car struck the rear of a vehicle driven by the defendant. The defendant had made an emergency stop without signaling. Where the plaintiff admits that he couldn't have stopped the car within a clear distance ahead, is he chargeable with contributory negligence? And if so, does that bar his recovery? See in my written article, example 10. Look at this, how they say it. Under Texas law, an attorney who has committed a crime of moral turpitude can be suspended from practice of law. Philip Sloke, a Texas attorney, was arrested for possession of illicit drugs. While her case was being investigated, but before she was prosecuted, much less convicted, the state bar did what? Suspended her law license. It's an arrest without a conviction for a crime of moral turpitude sufficient to justify the suspension. 73 words. Straight to the point, clear as a bell. Tip number 16. Make your point as simply as possible, but for goodness sake, don't oversimplify it. Simple, clear and harmonious style doesn't come easily. It's a product of much mental sweat and a critical evaluation and a force of effort. Lord Denning said, woolly thinking results in woolly writing. If you think clearly, then you will write simply. Sentences that start with the learned judge erred in law and in fact and misunderstood the evidence because then A, B, C, D, straight to the rubbish bin. Look at example number 11. The trial judge analyzed Donohue and Stevenson correctly, but took a fatal turn when he misapplied and overstated the law by holding that any and all local authorities cannot be held liable for negligence at all. There are three House of Lords' decision against this holding. The court should intervene and set matters right. That argument sounds interesting, even deadly serious. It has got an allure all by itself. It's compelling. So, right like that. Tip number 17. Avoid long quotations. Some lawyers will take one passage from a case and throw it there and the judge will be wondering where he is going. Quotations are the bane of a brief and they are a disease. They afflict many appellate judges. Just cite the principles. Don't throw a swathe of passages at the judge. Don't expect them to do your favor by scouring compass in hand for the one gem that you have placed under mass, a mass of verbiage. They would cast your brief to the winds and then goes your case. They would cast your brief to the winds and you're done. Tip number 18. When you place quotations, they detract from your authority as counsel. Don't stockpile what other people have said. You're not a quotation assembler, you know. If you do that, your writing won't have a clear analytical line. Paraphrase the judgments, summarize them, cite them in small chunks. The quotation should act as a catalyst. It should drive your narrative, not as a break. Tip number 19. Explain unfavorable arguments against you. Address unfavorable points at the first available opportunity. Give them a proper context. Show why they don't matter. That way you'll mitigate any potential harm that may befall you when your opponent rises and tries to assassinate your point. Tip number 20. State the facts dispassionately by use of a chronology. Tell the story. Do that in a chronological order. A good statement of fact passes two essential tests. First, it stands alone. A reader should understand what the case is about without looking at anything else. Second, the statement should make the reader take your side. It should be persuasive without being argumentative. So, chronology is essential. Place it at the end of your submissions in an appendix. Set out in one-liners exactly what happened in order of time. Show where the relevant documents are. 
prove when and how the events occurred. Show where the relevant passages are in the notes of proceedings. Point all that out in the chronology. This will help the judges navigate the maze of facts. They'd be ever so grateful. Even if you lose your appeal, the next time you are there in the Court of Appeal, you will get a favourable hearing because the judges know you are a hard-working lawyer, that you are trying to make it very clear for them. I, for example, use the iThought app. The iThoughts app is a mind map, so I know where I am going and I can arrange the arguments. Tip number 21, please index your work for courts navigation. Ensure your submissions have an index right at the front. Most text applications can manage this. Keep a clear index of documents at your site, both by page number and by subject index. Show the judges where the documents relate to are, for example, for breach of contract, this page to that page. Make it easy for them. Tip number 22, oral arguments, 90 seconds is all you have. Use it well. Time is premium. The shorter your sentences, the smaller the number of ideas, the greater the clarity and the more the judges will understand. They are looking for a summary of the case. In a nutshell, your issues, your answers, your position. Don't waste time by flipping pages. That means you're not prepared. And unless absolutely necessary, don't waste your time by pointing out case law or other statutory provisions. The whole world knows. Only when they ask, is there a case law to support your proposition? That means they're going to rule against you. Then say, yes, my ladies and my lords, and immediately show them where it is. Or say, my lords and my ladies, I'm sorry there's no case law on this point, but I'm hoping to persuade my lords and ladies to develop a proposition in this grey area. I've worked out a proposition premised on a series of case law. Could I please invite your lordships to look at it? I've written it down for you at this page. Can you please open it? Then show them how they should develop it. Be brave, be courteous, but watch your second hand all the time. Tip number 23, oral arguments again. Summarize your point. Don't start going into the evidence yet. Don't start going into the case law yet. Wait, wait, wait. The moment you get on your feet, explain what the problem is, explain what the answer is, explain why you are right straight off the bat. Don't waste time with non-essentials. The judges already have an idea of the essential points and relevant evidence. No veering, no hesitation, don't shuffle papers, don't show authorities, don't drag them into a mass of documents. There will be time for all that. When you've convinced them, they will ask you, where are the relevant documents? Where's the case law? What are your answers to the respondent's arguments? That is the time to show them. Until then, summarize, summarize, summarize. Wait for them to take a bite at the line. Wait! Don't straight away dive into the fathomless deeps. You will never come up for air and you will sink and drown. Tip number 24. Be ready for court's questions. When that happens, don't hide under the table or dive into the documents. Don't run off into the bundle of authorities. Watch your tone. Don't sound hysterical. Watch your pace. Slow down. You are not in the KLIA shuttle, you know. Be clear. Be precise. Pace yourself very well. Answer the questions directly. Confidently. Don't hesitate. Don't betray uncertainty. But be truthful. Be truthful. When you are truthful, it earns you many, many points for years ahead. If you have made a mistake, say so. I made a mistake. I'm sorry, my lord. But show why it doesn't make a mistake and show why it doesn't matter. Then say, if I have answered my lady's queries, could I please go on to develop my other points? By the way, always ask permission for everything. Never, never give the impression of misleading the court. You'd be branded for life have you not seen some counsel who vents his spleen at the Court of Appeal and the judges look indifferent out of the window? That's why. You should have seen Raja Aziz in action. The court would hang on to every word he'd say. Such courtesy, such depth of understanding, such humility. 
emulate him. Tip number 25. After showing the court that the law is on your side, don't pat yourself in the back. Don't hesitate. Keep going. Show evidence that the ruling that you seek is just and fair under the circumstances. Make the court comfortable that not only the law, but also the facts and the evidence favor your case and they come hand in hand. But never jump to the evidence at first. Do it only after establishing your legal point. Timing is everything. Arrangement is everything. Tip number 26. Have an answer to every point your opponent may raise. In fact, have two. If you are the appellant, you must be able to sink your opponent by pointing to an unfavorable fact or some legal authority that completely undermines his position. If not, don't bother. Be ready with those bullets. The bullets must kill, not injure. Must kill that argument. Use the bullets at the right time, in the right order. Timing is everything. Tip number 27. So your arguments are over. Check what relief you're going to ask the court at the end. Don't be caught napping. If you win, what relief will you seek? If you lose, what relief will you ask to mitigate injury to your client? Have those points ready. Get the authorities ready. Now, if you're the respondent, first numbers 1 to 27, we spoke about the appellant. Now we speak about the respondent. If you're the appellant, tip number 28, rephrase, consolidate, and neutralize the appellant. If you are the appellant, choose your grounds of complaint with the greatest care. If you are the respondent and your opponent hasn't chosen carefully, then rephrase what he's saying, consolidate it in such a way that the court has a better grasp of the futility and the error of the appellant's arguments. Then neutralize him. Tip number 29, your own submissions mustn't be dependent on just attacking the appellant. They must be freestanding. So when you're the respondent, Make your written submissions fully intelligible on its own without assuming that the judges have just read your opponent's brief. It must make sense without any external aid. It must be a standalone document. Tip number 30, draft the respondent's submissions before seeing your opponent's. When you write your own brief independently, it will help you develop your own case. It will keep you clear-headed. You won't be reacting to the appellant. You'd be proactive. Only after you have finalized your own submissions, look at your opponent's arguments. It is at that point you should fine tune your own brief and address your opponent's point, said one judge. So, if you are going to put yourself at the mercy of the appellant, you will find yourself in a defensive posture. He's going to hold your nose. He's going to drag you through the corridors of the court and you're going to look silly. No, you make your own way. Stand alone. Tip number 31. Rephrase the appeal and make ready for the federal court leave application. If you are responding against a strong appellant or a strong appeal case, then do a realignment exercise. Restructure the issue against you in such a way that the court of appeal has to answer your question. If possible, mentally draft your leave application question even at the high court stage. Then ensure that all the judges deal with it at the Court of Appeal so that you can rely on their answers and attack them at the Federal Court. That will then become the subject of a leave application all by itself and it can be easily mounted. So my dear friends, in the end, these are not the only strategies. When you're at the Court of Appeal, look at the way other counsel present the arguments. Take the good arguments, leave the bad. That's the only way you'll improve. Now, if you have some other suggestions, send them to me. I'll put your name put them up in the website. Otherwise, you know, we all have to learn all the time and we should be able to help other counsel in the bar learn from this. Thank you very much. Have a good day. If you like this video, please click like, subscribe and comment. And I'd be very obliged if you could share it with your friends and tell them to like it as well. Thank you very much. Have a good day.